When it comes to solving wicked problems, which are most of the issues that we deal with in our world, one of the approaches and theories that helps me understand wicked problems, which is basically everything that we're polarized about in this country, uh, is complex systems theory. So let's start by what's a system, and then I'm going to tell you what complex systems are not, and then we'll talk about what it actually means to have a complex system and understand how these wicked problems are actually examples of complex adaptive systems or output of a complex adaptive system. A system is any collection of moving parts that actually create uh, a greater whole and usually are producing something. There's some sort of output that they have. Now, coming out of the Renaissance, 1500s, 1700s, we had folks like Descartes, Newton, Francis Bacon, Galileo, and so forth, that were taking an approach to understanding the world, basically considered the world to be part of a mechanical universe. There's not a spirit in it. This is actually just a bunch of moving parts, and they're governed by a bunch of rules. Sometimes people call this the billiard ball universe, and so thinking like all the atoms are just bouncing in, into one another and so forth. This is the approach that we use when we're thinking about systems oftentimes, and it's actually the way we've been doing it for the last many centuries until just a couple decades ago. And these, this approach to understanding the world is thinking on closed, simple, and linear systems closed as in they have a container there's something that's in the system and there's stuff that's outside of the system and they're separate they also are simple even though they might be complicated as in like lots of moving parts but they're pretty simple you can take it apart and understand it a great example of a complex system would be a clock but also a factory is a great example of that if something breaks down in the factory you find out where it happens in the linear process and Usually you have a part you need to fix or you need to tweak it or lubricate it, something like that. When we're looking at regular systems or simple systems or closed systems, we're going to be fixing them by fixing a part of them or fixing or just improving the structure. Now, a complex system is something that is open, dynamic, and nonlinear, or and they are complex. <laughs> Complex systems theory was born out of a multidisciplinary experience. Various people who are studying biology, ecosystems, sociology, city planning, international relations, all were noticing similar dynamics. And somehow they figured out, wait a minute, you're starting to understand something. And this applies across all these disciplines because all of these different things are complex systems. Now, some examples of these are the economy, or a city is a great example of a complex system, a classic one. We can think about international politics as a complex system. Global supply chains, which are you know hot these days, are a complex system. Other healthcare system, a human body is a complex system. Any ecosystem that we can see, and of course our country or our democracy is also a complex system. So what makes a complex system? So again, like all systems, they have many parts. But in this case, all the different parts are interconnected and interdependent. And each of the parts are autonomous. So in a complex system, the control is distributed throughout the system. All the different parts are doing their own thing, making their own decisions. And there isn't some sort of hierarchical control that's telling them how to operate. They also are non-linear. Um, this means that they're fundamentally, it means that they're unpredictable. But it means that any change that we make in the system will have a disproportionate impact throughout the system. So just small change over here can have a huge impact over the thing, or maybe a really big change over here might have a relatively small impact. Because there's all these different moving parts that are interconnected and interdependent and autonomous and making their own decisions, any change might have a bigger change than you would expect. This is what's known as the butterfly effect that is talking about non-linearity. Another aspect of a complex system is they have this emergent quality, meaning that all the different parts doing all of their different things 
end up creating becoming like a greater whole and that greater whole doesn't look like the parts so a, an emergent property of humans if you smash a bunch of humans together consensually you get a city is what happens and so a city is a great example of an emergent system and of course they start forming democracies and, and structures and so forth like that another important aspect of an emergent system or a complex uh, system is it's is uncertainty we actually don't really know what's going to happen when something happens so that uncertainty is related to the nonlinearity also related to the fact that they are dynamic systems, which means that any change in the circumstances is going to impact the rest of the system and it'll change the outcome. So if you change the, what's going on around it, then the actors or the agents inside of the system will start acting in a different way. And that's, by the way, because it's an open system. So an open system means that you can't tell where the edge is. If we were going to try to think about the healthcare system, we would start with like doctors and hospitals, and then we'd be like, okay, ambulances, okay, EMTs, but actually, should we include the patients? And okay, so now it's like everyone, but like, what about the people who bring the food to the system? Or what about the food system or the advertising that's getting people to eat crappy food or really delicious food or healthy food? All of those things start becoming part of the healthcare system, and it's we don't know where the boundaries are. And things that happen, externalities, will ch cause the whole system to change. That's what makes it dynamic. And so a dynamic system also means that something that worked yesterday or 10 years ago won't necessarily work today because we're in a different context. So whatever solution that you know might have worked in the past might not work now and it might not work in the future. That's another part. And there's also this way that a, complex systems are have these evolutionary aspects to them in the sense that the, what happened in the past has like a really big impact and will create the present. But you can't go backwards. You can't go back to the past. It's always changing and it's always changing from past to the future. So there's something about all of this that makes complex systems be patterned. So it looks like we can see patterns within them, but we also know that they're unpredictable. And one of the things that I find to be really helpful in understanding this is focusing on the relationships more than the parts. So as we said, with the old closed, simple systems, linear systems, if something's broken, we fix the part, we find the part. But in a complex system, we don't change the parts. We actually pay attention to the relationships. And one way I like to think about this is if you think about any organism as a like a living organism, as a complex system, we want to change it. We wouldn't go and just take out the part and replace it and put a new part in. Okay, I know we can put like new knees in or something like that. But for the most part, you're trying to actually change the relationships of the different pieces. And you know, I like to think about this when I'm thinking about an organization or a company. If people aren't getting along or bad decisions keep on getting made, you could try to make a bunch of rules. That would be the old systems approach to it. But the best way to do it would actually change the quality of the relationships in a certain way, get better communication or develop some principles that can sort of guide the different actions. Those are the different things that arise from focusing on the relationships more than the parts. Just a couple of thoughts about complexity before we move on to polarity thinking is how do we measure co complexity? Complexity is measured by three things, multiplicity, interdependence, and diversity. So multiplicity is how many different parts are moving in the system. Interdependence is about how interconnected they are, how much do each action impact the other actions, and how diverse, how diverse is it, how heterogeneous it is, how, how many different kinds of actors are acting inside the system. And the more multiplicity, more interdependence, and more diversity means more complexity. And, and this 
of course, is what gets us to these wicked problems. When we're trying to figure out what do we do about the economy? What do we do about COVID? Or what do we do about the military? Or what do we do about climate change? We realize that there aren't simple solutions. Every action that we take is going to ripple out in much bigger ways than we could have expected. And so complex adaptive systems or complex systems theory or complexity theory, all of these are um, ways that can help us understand the nature of the issues that we're looking at. And then we have to figure out how we're going to approach it. Now, there's some really great theories and ideas that come from the world of design. The designers are coming up with a lot of great ideas on how to approach wicked problems and complex systems and so forth. But one of the things that comes up is we have to choose an approach. What are we going to do as we try to resolve any of these issues? Do we try to centralize power? Do we try to decentralize power? Do we try to um, focus on the big picture? Do we focus on the individuals? Do we focus on the past? Do we focus on the future? Do we focus on what worked? Or do we focus on what might work? All of these are actually interdependent polarities. The answer to all of those is yes and. Uh, it's not an either or question. Our issue is that we keep on thinking that they're one or the other, and that's what gets us into polarization. But the whole world of polarity thinking is going to help us get out of this puzzle. Coming next, I'm going to talk a little bit more about polarity thinking and polarity management and polarity mapping as a way to help us engage with interdependent polarities when we actually can't choose one approach or the other. So stay tuned and coming up in my next video, I'll be talking about polarity thinking and how it can help us figure out the best approach or approaches to managing complex systems and handling the wicked problems that we have to figure out how to handle. Cool. Stay tuned. Subscribe. We got some more coming up.